Linda and I have been in the appraisal business for 27 years. We started out in classic cars and got involved with the American Society of Appraisers, became a fully certified senior appraiser. And then in 07, we decided to get involved in trailering and travel trailers. And you know how one thing leads to another when people in the group find out that you're a personal property appraiser and you do all kinds of fancy aircraft and all kinds of fancy cars, well, why not move into trailers and RVs? So we started doing that. Now the bulk of our business is trailers and RVs, 15 to 20 a month. Uh, we stay very heavily involved in the vintage world because we also, the trailer you saw and you'll see in the slides in a few minutes is our 1954 Flying Cloud, which incidentally is in a movie coming out in the near future called Illumination. So if you ever get a chance to see it, you'll see our trailer. My credentials, um, I'm a degreed engineer, a professionally licensed engineer, but the most important thing for you all to know is we're accredited by the American Society of Appraisers as a senior appraiser, which means if you go to court or you go to arbitration, they look at your credentials. And this is the highest level of credential you can get in the appraisal business. Okay, next slide. What we're gonna cover today is a little about values how to, how to determine a value of a trailer, but also a lot about insurance. It's really important that you go away from this presentation with a clear, clear understanding of what type of insurance you should have and the people that offer that type of insurance. There's several companies that do, but FCIS is one that is, their prices are competitive and uh, they're really good to work with and they pay claims. They pay on claims, that's the important thing. We're gonna go, go over a little bit about insured value. We're gonna go over a little bit about total loss. And if you're buying or selling, if you're, now, believe it or not, there's a lot of vintage traders being financed. Uh, legal issues, either whether it's custom or restoration and what level of customization and restoration you're doing and what value that creates. And then uh, value guides, which basically there aren't any. <coughs> you probably have already figured out I'm gonna to try to stay out of the way of you guys over here. It's kind of hard for me to do, but you probably already figured out. If, if you're watching the, uh, your vintage trailer world at all, you know that values are increasing, right? That's kind of a no-brainer. There's nothing that I see on the horizon that's gonna change that. Not, you know, the economy can melt down and the stock market melts down one week or another, but our vintage trailer values you're gonna see in a minute are continuing to increase. The other thing, that, a lot of people don't think about is when the demand exceeds a supply, what happens? Prices go up, right? Nobody's making vintage trailers, right? They were all made at some point in time and that's it. And as one gets wrecked or sent to Indonesia or Taiwan or goes foreign, it's gone. We heard yesterday $150 an hour for restoration so what does that do if you're going to, as we all know, those in here that do a lot of restoration and, and pointing at John over here, what we know is it takes twice as many hours to do one of these in a way of restoration than we think it's going to. And some of us who do it ourselves kind of have a, we, we have a pretty good feel for what it's going to take. But when you go to a shop, 40 hours is nothing. And if the, if the rate's 150 bucks, there you go. New trailers and RVs are increasing in price very rapidly, actually. The last two or three years, prices have gone up way more than 15 or 20% on new RVs. Now, I think if the economy slows down a little bit, that'll back off a little bit, but that also takes our values, our vintage values up with it. What we're gonna talk a lot about today is the next subject. I don't want you to leave this event without having a good, clear understanding. I was having fun in the front row here a little while ago and I had a couple of victims to pick on. And we talked, we talked about things like tow behind policies, standalone policies and agreed value policies. It's really important, before we get into value, let me give you a short version of each of those and then we'll get into values and you can decide for yourself how important it is. I'll bet virtually 70% of this audience, if you would admit it, have what's called a tow behind policy because you called your insurance agent up and you said, I have a trailer, I'm towing it, 
and I want to have it insured. Your agent will say, fine, that's good. What are you towing it with? You'll give him your tow vehicle, and he'll connect the two on a policy. It'll be very inexpensive, a couple hundred bucks, maybe less, maybe a little more, and away you go down the road. Just so you understand, the only time that trailer's covered is when it's hooked up to that tow vehicle. When it's setting out here in this RV park, it's not covered if a tree falls on it. Hook it up before you call your insurance or take a picture. <laughs> but I get a kick out of this because it, it, it's not funny for the people that had a lot of fire. We had a lot of fire issues in Southern California in the last uh, couple of years. And the trailer's sitting behind their, beside their house, not covered, because it's not hooked up to the tow vehicle. So I've had people in this audience before pick up their phone and call their agent while we're in the while we're in this session and the agent will say, yep, he's right. It's only covered when it's hooked up to the tow vehicle. The next kind of policy is a standalone policy. So let's say you go out and buy a new whatever, a new air, let's say you go buy a new Airstream and you pay 60, 70 grand for it. A standalone policy covers that trailer wherever it is, under what cir whatever circumstances it is, it covers it as a standalone entity. If it's sitting out here and a tree falls on it, it's covered. If it's sitting at your house, a tree falls on it, it's covered. It's a standalone policy on that vehicle. When you start doing it on a new trailer, it's easy. The insurance company says, how much you pay for it? So you paid 70 grand. So they're just gonna write a policy and the trailer's one, two years old or even newer, it's no big deal. So it's okay. Now the issue comes when you have the $20,000 Shasta. It's a 1965. The insurance companies have no idea what it's worth. You can tell them maybe you paid what you paid for it or you can tell them what it costs you to restore it. And if you just leave it at that point, they're gonna say, well, it's insured for fair market value or they call it actual cash value. And that's fine until something happens. When it happens, they're gonna say that Shasta trailer in our analysis is worth five grand. It's probably really worth 20. And then you pick up the phone and you call me and we start the fight. We're not gonna get, get where we need to be, but we're gonna get better than what they initially offered you. I just had one a few weeks ago, an open road, open road uh, 69 open road, uh, covered by Geico. A uh, lady just got a tow behind policy on it and hooked it up to her truck, took off down the highway, big windstorm, truck and trailer both rolled, and the insurance company says we'll pay you $4,000 for her for your trailer. She said, well, I've got fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 in restoration costs in this trailer. She got them up to $4,500. Well, when she got me involved, I got them up to about ten grand, and they settled, but it would have been a lot better a lot better if we would have had an agreed value policy on it before we started. So, there are a few companies around, and we're gonna get into this in more detail in a minute, and we're gonna show you more examples of why this is necessary. But Overland Insurance and FCIS Insurance and the Miller Agency are the only three that I know of to that write agreed value policies. And they're gonna to have to write that policy based on something. It's normally an appraisal provided by me, based on something. And, and when they write the policy, that's the contract. That's just like a contract. Trader rolls, totaled. We're gonna get into total loss in a minute. When it's rolled and totaled, they're gonna write a check for the amount of money that's on the agreed value policy. You got it? Okay, we'll get questions on this in a few, more, <coughs> few minutes. Let's talk a little about total loss, since we're now talking about $20,000 vintage trailers, right? A lot of our trailers are in inching up, inching up. The more restoration you do, the more customization you do in some cases, not in all, but the more restoration you do, the more valuable they become. And now as each year goes by, they're becoming more valuable on their own. Actual cash value is what an insurance company calls the same as fair market value. That means their adjuster goes out into the marketplace. This is a person who knows nothing about a vintage trailer, nothing whatsoever, goes out into the marketplace. The first place they always look is Craigslist. 
and, and they find a bunch of old trailers and they tell you that your trailer's worth an actual cash value of three grand. They found some. We all know what those are that they've found. They've never been touched. They've been sitting out in a hay field somewhere and they're full of mice and all that kind of stuff. That's what they determine is actual cash value. But let's just say, for example, you have a trailer, let's use a $20,000 Shasta as an example, and damage occurs, and the damage is worth, uh, let's, let's say the damage, the repair bill is about five grand. Well, they think the only trailer is only worth five grand. So they're gonna total it and they're gonna write you a $5,000 check for your $20,000 trailer. That's not what you wanna have happen, right? So uh, typically 65% rule applies if you have it properly insured, and it's a newer trailer, let's just say it's a newer, newer trailer, you have it properly insured, when the bill, the hail damage uh, exceeds 65% of what they determine the value of the trailer is, they're gonna total it. They're gonna write you a check for the total value, and it's always gonna be less than what it's really worth. Recent hail, ex recent hail damage, uh, we had one of these in Santa Fe after Steve Hinchin's deal, somebody left Santa Fe. In fact, the hail occurred at the Santa Fe event. I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, it did. There was hail there. <laughs> and uh, on the way home, they had another hailstorm, but then they realized, oops, the whole top of the trailer was pot-marked. Oh <laughs> and it was fun. It was a fun deal. We, we settled it properly, and everybody was happy. But they had an agreed value policy on it. Okay, next slide, please. It's really important to establish the value of the trailer. You need to establish the value of your trailer. Don't let the insurance company establish the value of your trailer. That's the important message here, right? Okay. Okay, move on. Next slide. We all know about buying and selling. And we, we all like to brag about what we paid for something and, and, and what, we, what we found something in a hayfield for. And then, of course, you start taking the walls apart and we realize that we didn't really get a bargain, but we're going to have a lot of fun restoring it, right? <laughs> People start talking about if you go online and you want to look up the value of a trailer, one of the first lines in Google will be NADA. I have a commercial version of NADA, and I'd be happy to look anything up for anybody that wants it. All you have to do is email me. But the thing I get a kick out of is it really is about 50% off of the market. Pick a modern trailer, pick a $50,000 Airstream. It really is about 50% 50, 50 off because the dealers want you to come trade your trailer in, and they want to give you a value that NADA says, right? Well, it works for them, it just doesn't work for us when we go out, want to claim the value of our trailer because it's getting totaled, right? So NADA issues, always remember what I said. What's NADA? National Dealer, National Association of Dealers. And I don't know what the last A means. Association. It's the big, it's like Kelly, it's like Kelly Blue Book. You all know what Kelly Blue Book is? NADA happens to also include RVs. Thank you. The, remember that when you're looking at a, any sort of a transaction, the market value, take all the emotion out of it. The market value is what something sells for, not what somebody is asking for something. I'm moving a little into that issue because it's gonna be all over the rest of my slides, all right? Remember also that the values of our collectible RVs are increasing, not decreasing. No matter what you hear, no matter what you think you hear, because demand is exceeding supply. And each year that goes by, that old trailer that we all just thought was a piece of junk sitting next to mom's house, it's probably something that worth considering, particularly if it's a model that, particularly if it's a model that gets highlighted in here. Guess what sits on my desk all the time? Because this is the best. This is the best collection. This is the best collection. I find a few that aren't in here, and I'm going to get these guys going on a few others. There's a few that aren't in here, but this is the best collection of any document I've ever seen. It really is cool. 
So when that old trailer sitting out next to the shed, next to mom's house, take a look at the book, see if it's in there. And you might be able to go online and find it. Oh, that, that trailer, there's some real value. Shasta Compact, for example. Okay, move next slide, please. Yesterday we had a question about customization and the value of the value of a trailer that's been customized. <clears throat> There's only one category that I want you to think about a little bit. Only one category that is an exception to that rule. That category is the absolute barn fine, perfect, original 1950s or 60s trailer. Don't touch it. It needs to go into a museum somewhere. Yeah. You really can't use it because it's going to fall apart if you go down the road with it. But the Murphy Automobile Museum has a 1927 Holt. And one of a kind, uh, valued it in the six figures. It's really not functional as a travel trailer. It was built as a prototype for a company that was going to move into the trailer manufacturing business. They didn't. They built several prototypes. It needs to set in a museum somewhere. Okay, let's take that. Think about that category. Everything else that we're doing tends to increase the value of the trailer, not decrease it. So if you want to customize it, go after it. You know, just don't paint it pink, right? Sorry, ladies. But, you know, a Shasta that came out in multicolors, you know, try to keep it as original on the outside as you can. And don't hang other types of widgets and gadgets on it. I love the ones I see going down the road with a brand new modern huge air conditioner sitting on top. You know, anyway, there's very little you can do to the trailers to damage their value. Unless it's that trailer that I referred to that belongs in a museum somewhere. That one you don't want to touch, right? Okay, we understand, everybody understands that now their values are not recognized by insurance companies, right? They have no clue. Probably the only insurance company that I talk to, I talk to these guys a couple times a week. The only ones that are starting to understand it because they do so many is FCIS. They're starting to understand when I call them that a Shasta is worth 20, 25 grand, they aren't starting to, well, they don't even question it. They write an agreed value policy on it. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, I know. That'll work a little better, thank you. Let's talk, identify a little bit differences in, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this because it tends to bore people to tears. I really get into it, it's my big deal. But it tends to bore people to tears. What I'm gonna do is give you several categories of the type of way I value trailers and the way I, what I look at to determine which category they're in. That's all this is. It'll help you a little bit because it'll give you a little better idea of how I would look at something if you asked me to appraise your trailer. Next slide, please. Next slide. This is a top of the line, $150,000, everything new, new chassis, axles, hydraulic brakes, stainless steel tanks, every piece of electronics updated, everything possible, all walnut interior, uh, it, it really top of the line, everything. If you walked inside of it, you would say, whoa, this is a brand new trailer. Well, it is a brand new trailer built inside of an old shell. That's what this level of number one restored custom means. This could be a Shasta, this could be anything else you wanna call it, but it's that one that you walk inside and it's all new. Doesn't even look anything like the original trailer, but the outside shell. The outside shell, other than being polished, is basically an original trailer. Next slide, please. Example of a number two would be something that is, you know, it's got a lot of originality to it, it's got a lot of new cabinets built inside, a lot of new interior, probably leather and a bunch of other things, but still looks, still looks pretty original and it still functions. It's got all the same functionality it had when it was new. Next slide, please. Very rare, Curtis Wright number one. Basically looks like the day it came out of the factory, only better. Um, and, and so it's an idea of another number two kind of trailer. Somewhat original, but not perfect. If you're an original snob, you would walk in that trailer and you'd say, nah. it's not perfect, but it's a beautiful piece of work. Next one. Original Corvette. 
an original Corvette with a whole new interior in it. There's a value range. Didn't have a chassis rebuild, didn't come off the chassis, doesn't have new plumbing necessarily in it, doesn't have new wiring necessarily, it might have, but, they, but it's essentially an original one, all right? Streamlines, streamlines are popping way up in value and I think it has something to do with the fact that they're a metal trailer and they have that, they have that, uh, that, anyway, they look like a metal trailer going down the road and everybody loves them. Spartans are popping way up in value too. Next one, please. Typical down the road, number four, Airstream, never really had anything done to it. A few upgrades inside, it's all functional. It gives you a value range. And this is one that probably is barely on the road, barely still campable. Furnace probably doesn't work. Water heater most likely doesn't work. It's a shell that needs, is worthy of restoration. The reason I used it, go back to that one, will you? The reason I used it in the photo is take a look at the skin. It's almost perfect. Next one, please. Uh, one more time, what's driving prices? Demand versus supply, right? And uh, the amount of money we're spending restoring, right? Think about it. What's driving prices? There really is a desire. We're living in an era, I'm a baby boomer. We're living in an era where per people want to go back in time to the simpler days. And that's the whole hobby. We're, we're all here for the same reason. Then there's the Hollywood effect. It's now really cool. It's now really cool to have a vintage trailer sitting in your backyard. It used to be, well, it's a junker sitting back there, right? We need to get rid of it. Not anymore. Now decks are being built around them. And it, the cost of restoration, restoration, we've already talked about that. Typical rates these days are, you know, maybe the low of 100 and the high of 175. The market continues. I don't see the labor rates changing, although that slide needs to be updated, right? I don't know of anybody that works at 75 anymore. Materials cost for new design, original interior, everything you're doing, whether it be this, or whether it's wiring or any form of plumbing, it's all going way up in price. And then new, tra new trailer prices. Go out and buy a stick-built new trailer. You know, I used to get them for 15, 20 grand. Now they're 35, 40 grand. They last 10 years and fall apart. Okay, next slide, please. Take a look at, I've praised Shasta trailers way back in here. I have a database that's just to die for. We talk about it all the time in the business. We have tens of thousands of trailers in our data, our personal database. I don't share it with anybody because it's a value of our business. But take a look at what's going on. And I tried, when I did this, I tried to take trailers that were very comparable, very similar in the level of restoration that they've had done to them. I just looked, I didn't update the slide before we came up here. I got busy doing some other things. This probably leveled out a little bit between January of 19 and January of 20. Probably not continuing on this same curve, but it's still going up. Next slide, please. Airstreams, same, same basis, more of a steady in, increase. Go back to the Shasta slide again. Here's what, you, what uh, this is what I want you to notice. We probably all had these sitting around back in 11, 10, 11, 12. You know, the economy melted down in 09. Remember all the things that went on? Then things kind of leveled out. I don't really know what happened in 12 and 13. What's that? Paul really got going. Yeah, Paul got going. That's it. But since 12 and 13, it's just been a continuing, continuing value. And what I do is I'm out looking at values of traders all the time. I look at asking prices. I look at sold prices. I talk to everybody I can talk to, finding out what's really going on. I'm on eBay. I'm on Craigslist. I'm on all the other sources all the time. I have five or six screens going in my office and I'm looking at comps for everything I do. Sometimes I'll go right to my database and I'll go, oh, I got five of those in the last three months. Well, I don't need necessarily to go find new ones, but I'm out looking for new ones all the time and then I dump them into a Shasta database. Next slide, please. Airstreams are pretty consistently up. Remember the pictures you saw 
when I did this analysis, I tried to use ones of similar levels of restoration, just like I did on the Shasta. So this is, numbers are pretty accurate. Next slide, please. Typical canned ham, there's some examples of them. Uh, some of us might not have thought those were gonna do what they've done, but you see it got a little, it's been a little crazy here. A couple of years ago, got a little, well, it's leveled out a little bit now. This, I would guess if I had updated the slides, it would still be somewhat up, certainly not down. Next slide, please. So what's going on? Of course, the 40s trailers, no matter what you call it, they're gonna be the most desirable. They've got the coolest factors re related to them. And of those 40s, you know, the Airstream, the Westies, and the, Chris Cra the Curtis Wrights. There you go, some examples. The 50s trailers, Airstream, Shasta, and Spartans, and I'm sure I've left out a few. If you're looking at some the most desirable, that means the market wants, everybody in the market wants that trailer. 60s, uh, 70s aren't on this sheet, but a few years ago, the 70s traders, eh, nobody really cared, right? Now the 70s are starting to pick up. 70s Airstreams are now find, getting hard to find. A few years ago, 70s Airstreams were setting everywhere. Now they're getting hard to find. Next slide, please. Same reason as the previous four or five slides. Demand driven, iconic made in America, rest in, restoration costs. Now, you, those of us who've been involved in classic cars, we had a pretty good conversation going on over here earlier, know that what you always want to do is buy a classic car that someone else has dumped twice as much money into as what the market says it's worth, right? Start thinking about what that with these trailers. The cost of restoration can easily exceed thirty or forty thousand dollars on a Shasta. Market says it's probably worth twenty-five. Start thinking about that. What you put into the trailer isn't necessarily what you're going to get out of it, right? You're hopefully going to get some years of use, and you're going to get a lot of fun, and it's going to be very showy, and everybody's going to want to see it. But you probably put more in it than it's really worth. So think about it when you're out looking for trailers to purchase. Next slide, please. I'm gonna go back on insurance one more time because I don't want you to leave here without understanding this. So when we get into the question session here in just a minute or two, feel, please feel free. We'll bore into this even some more. But remember the difference between an agreed value policy, a standalone policy, and a tow behind policy. And remember what you're covered for and what you aren't covered for. If, you've, if you bought a trailer and pulled out of a hayfield and you took it home and you're starting to work on it, you know, don't worry too much about it, right? Really, I, I, I mean that. Don't worry too much about it. But when it starts creeping up in what you th you're getting it finished, it's starting to look pretty good, you've probably repainted it, you've probably got a new interior put in it, you need to start thinking about it before you hook it up behind your truck and tow it away. Start thinking about what kind of policy you have on it. <clears throat> Remember also that typically a first time an insurance professional will look at the actual value of your trailer is when you have a claim. No one's going to have looked at it and said, oh yeah, we think it's worth about X, Y, Z. No. Your agent may say that. Your agent has nothing to do with the actual claim being submitted and the payment on a claim. Your agent's completely out of it. He might fight for you. They might fight for you, but they're, they're completely out of it. Remember also that if you're into the 10 plus, 15,000 plus, 20,000 dollar trailer, it's probably time to have a professional look at it and write an appraisal on it and have that as your document that you give to your insurance company. FCIS will write an agreed value policy based on the appraised value. And it's good for indefinite future, but remember you also saw in those curves where the values are going up, for our business, we, we reappraise regularly for people eh, three, five years down the road. You don't need to do it every year. We do it for half price. So if we've got you in our database and we've charged you 250 bucks to do the initial appraisal, when you come back at us, we're going to do it for half price. And I wouldn't do it more than every three, three to five years. Remember also that when you're making a claim, many owners 
are going to jump around. They're going to all the websites. They're going to go to all these things to try to say, look, here's what my trailer's worth, right? Well, that's what you think it's worth, the insurance company. You, you, unfortunately, you've got to have somebody in between, somebody with credentials in between to determine what it's really valued at. Next slide, please. There are a few of us around, there's a few appraisers around in the country with very few that have credentials. So remember, th this is probably the only advertising you're gonna get from me, this is it. Remember that if you really get into a fight, what you want is your appraiser to have credentials. I appraise multi-million dollar Gulfstream aircraft, if you all know what a G5 is and a G550 and all those things. When I go to the LA County to get into a fight with tax values, if I didn't have credentials, I can't even get in the door. The same thing applies to our little $20,000 trailers. It's no different. It's, you need to have credentials if you're gonna hire somebody to do an appraisal. You go to an RV dealer and they'll say, yeah, I'll give you a sheet of paper. And they'll, they'll write down that they think it's worth $15,000. What do you think that's worth? I hope you didn't pay anything for it. Okay, next slide, please. We'll leave this one up. We have a few, we have business card, we have business cards, so please feel free to grab one out of the pile when I get them out here in a minute. Um, now, questions and answers, please. We'll try to answer anything we can. Yeah, John. Uh, for Connie and I, uh, so far we've talked about like the value of the trailer, and uh, you know, can you afford basically to lose 